Hey, what's good, everyone? Welcome back to the Outside the Box podcast. My name is Nick Ingvall, and today I've got a guest I've been wanting to talk to for a really long time, Reham Habib. She has been a light in the sneaker world for many years and recently left uh, some pretty high up positions in the in the swoosh family. I'll leave it at that. But I'm really excited to share her journey and, and talk to her today. So how are you doing? I am so good. Thank you so much for having me. It's so exciting to finally meet you, well, digitally, uh, because we've been following each other since the early days of Twitter. So this is such a treat for me. Um, yeah. I'm excited to be here. I, I so enjoy your pod, your you know, your podcast. So I, I just feel honored. So thank you. Well, I, I feel honored as well. It's It really has been, you know, years of, of wanting to connect. I feel like you travel the world a lot and I move a lot. So there's been so many times where it's mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm going to be in New York. Oh, I'm going to be in LA oh, or I'm going to be in Portland. And it just never worked out. So one day, you know, right. it will and we'll get to grab a coffee or something together and, and meet in person. But this is great. I'm so happy to talk to you because I think that, as I was saying before we started recording, I think that there are so many people that look up to you for you know so many different reasons, but you're just always a positive person in this space. And it's, it's, it's something that progressively has been harder for people to remain positive in the sneaker world, right? Because everything is, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're kind of in this weird funnel situation where everybody's looking at one place and, you know, when millions of people are looking at one place, not everybody has the opportunity to, to, to get through the door in, in many, you know, ways. So, um, how, yeah. how did you, how did you get started in sneakers? How, like what, what was your first interest in sneakers and then how did you get into the business of sneakers? Yeah. So, I mean, a little bit about me just for context. So my, I'm from Egypt. Uh, my parents, uh, moved to the U.S. when I was young. So as an immigrant family, you know, we didn't have very much money growing up. And I always looked at Nike Adidas with aspiration. You know, I couldn't afford those brands um, when I was young. So when I was in college, I got my first pair of Jordans. And it was the AJ9. And I, so what first got me into sneakers was Michael Jordan. I mean, he is my favorite athlete of all time. You can have any GOAT conversation you want, but he is the one, right? And um So it was really him that got me into, I would always, I would remember, even though I couldn't get my hands on them or afford them, looking forward to seeing the new shoe every year. The commercials were the best, like frozen moments, right? Uh, Still gives me goosebumps. And um, and so that was really the beginning. And I love sport. Like I grew up playing tennis. I was, I used to be a massive football fan. Like you couldn't even talk to me on a Sunday, you know, from... (laughs) noon to eight plus the night game i would just be in front of a tv and basketball uh, was great and my brother and i grew up um watching basketball together and whenever the bulls were on it was like the only moment we weren't arguing because we're so close in age you know so when we were growing up that was like the peace moment was the bulls being on tv so that's what really got me started or at least from my just a personal interest um was just my love for sport that's so awesome. I so my first pair of Jordans was a Jordan Nine too, and it was, uh, you know, same kind of scenario. I mean, my my grandparents were immigrants, but like my on, or my great grandparents on my on both sides, and then my parents got divorced and all this stuff. But like, you know, we we moved from a place to place with people from the church because my, you know, we just didn't have a lot, and we kind of worked mm-hmm. our way around. So I I did the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I just looked up at like you know, Michael was the, you know, like, how does this guy do this? You know, how do you, how do you, like, how do you not realize how, like, how incredible this person is? And then as a kid, you know, you're kind of obsessing over sneakers and all the adults around you are like, sneakers? Why are you, what? Like, what do you, you know? So, um, but it's funny because I, the, I was in seventh or I was in eighth grade and I had worked like a couple different summer jobs and I bought a pair of the Jordan nines, the, the black and charcoal ones. Mm. And mm-hmm. I was still like, let's say five, 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 six, five, seven. I was very short at that time, but I had already, uh-huh. yeah. I, had, I was already wearing a size 13. So my uncles, when I bought that shoe made fun of me because I, they said I look like an L because I was just like L shaped because oh my-, my feet were so big. <laughs> But, you know, and, and I grew into it. I'm, I'm a little, you know, six, one, six, two now. So I feel, I feel better about that now, but it was always, always yeah. such a big deal for me. Cause it was like, I, I felt like you just, 
I don't know if we have that now in the sneaker world, but like you just felt like a more personal connection to to mm-hmm. to, to MJ and to, to the players mm-hmm. back then that you just don't quite have because there's so many distractions and for better and worse, right? A lot of those distractions allow us to do things like this and have conversations with people around the world, but it yeah. was it, yeah. it was definitely a shared thing and I, I it's so funny too like I I feel like we probably were doing the same thing in different places where I would sit down with my brother and like WGN and we got to watch the game and we just thought it was cool because we were listening to people from Chicago and being on the West coast, it was like, we didn't really know people from Chicago. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, pretty crazy times. So how, how how did, how did that lead you into working in the footwear business? Well, um, Super interesting. So ever the first time I went to Chicago as a kid, um, I was 16. My parents took took us on a you know road trip from Minneapolis and went to my first Nike store. And I remember leaving the store with a mug. It was the only thing I could afford to buy with my own money at the time. So a little swoosh mug. And I remember turning my brother and I said, I'm going to work at Nike someday. So then fast forward to college and I really wanted an internship at Nike. But back then they were unpaid. And I don't know about you, but I worked full time to put myself through school and I could not figure out how to do an unpaid internship. Like I, I thought about it. I saved money, but I couldn't make the math work because they also didn't, you know, at the time provide housing either. So that was a no go. So I kind of put that to the side. But again, because of my love for sport, it was always sort of an aspiration. Um, I thought to myself, like, oh, my God, how cool would it be to be able to work in sport? Like it was more about that versus sneakers at the time. Yeah. Because I didn't actually connect that I could do a job in sneakers. It was more like Nike's a sport company. They sponsor all these great athletes. Um, and I want to be part of that magic, you know? Um, and so after college, I ended up working at a department store. And to make a very long story short, I uh, moved to New York for several, several, several years and worked at different brands, all in the apparel industry. And then one day Nike came calling and they tried to recruit me. And at the time I was like, well, you know, if you have a job in New York, we can talk. And um, New York is like a spirit city. So I was really focused on staying there. Um, But then some things happened a few years later and they came calling again. Um, And at that time I had had left, um, I was working at Mark Echo Enterprises. So I was leading the apparel business for 50 Cent back then. And um, I was like, well, you guys are lucky because I'm actually in the, I'm looking for a new role, new job. And so they were like, okay, well, come in and interview. So I, they flew me out to campus, which was beautiful. Had an amazing experience, didn't get that job. Then a few months later they called and they said, we have the perfect job for you. And it's with the Jordan brand. And again, I was like, wait a minute, you mean Michael Jordan? And they said, yeah, and I'm like, whatever it is, I'll do it. I don't even need to know. Just I'll do whatever I have to do. I want, that's the job I want. And it turned out to be amazing. And and I spent 13 years there and um, I joined the company through apparel, but then I ended up being fortunate and um, was given the trust to lead uh, a couple of business, a couple of different businesses holistically as a GM, where I, you know, worked with the team to set the or strategy and the apparel strategy and marketing and had a lot of fun doing that. That's so awesome. So So, to answer your question, I guess I just fell into it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because that's something that I, I think, I think we still, as much as like there's books about it and there's people that talk about it all the time, just moving forward in life towards the things that you want, whether you are, you know, physically driving to Portland, Oregon to be a part of Nike or whether you're just in your mind, like moving towards these things is so important. And, yep. and I just believe so much in, in that. And I think that you know, one of the things with this podcast that I'm trying to do is like have the conversations that I would have outside of sneakers, but within the context Mm -hmm. of sneakers, because Mm -hmm. I, I love the people that I've met in sneakers. I love the opportunities that I've had. Like I, I want to show people and introduce people to everyone and everything that I've experienced. You know, I still feel like a little kid in the candy store when I look around and like think, like, oh, this is happening or these people are doing this, or I got a pair of these and this person got this and this is their story. But one of the things that you mentioned there too that I think is really interesting, you know, it's 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 always fascinating to me to hear the it's a it's a consistent message from from everybody that I talk to where, 
you know, and depending on when you got interested in this stuff, you know, sport has always been the kind of driver for it, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, maybe in more recent years, yes, there's an entertainment aspect and a social media mm -hmm. aspect, but like, it it sounds like even, you know, from your perspective, you, you know, you don't really, uh, didn't really understand at the time, the connection with like, sneakers and footwear and like the massive industry that's behind that, which, mm -hmm. you know, sport, thankfully led most of us into this, right? But yeah. I'd really love to know what you think about how we could, like, I guess, elevate or showcase or, or kind of shed some light onto all of the opportunities that exist. Because what I continually end up having conversations, especially with the like really younger generation, is that the perception is, is still just like when I was a teenager. I was either going to be a designer Mm -hmm. like, you know, the CEO, or I'd work in a Nike store. And that's really right. the only things that I know about as, as yep. someone who's not fully connected. So how, what what would you do to kind of make light of, or shed light on some of those other opportunities? How could we, how could we collectively do that as a community, I guess? Yeah, I think, you know, I actually think that the industry, whether it's retailers or brands can, can do the most work in this space by being more active, um, in recruitment on college campuses, right? And showcasing the breadth of the career opportunities available because that's really, for the most part, to get into brands or even um, less so retail, but you know, you, most brands require a college education of some sort, right? Whether you finish or not, it's a different story. So I think that is one compelling way because you have the opportunity to share your story as a brand. You have your opportunity to share um, how someone can build a career, what are the different aspects that they could consider, right? Um, and I think that does a lot to spread the word. I also think that doing things like this and having conversations for the audience um, and for people who aren't interested in sneakers, for them or apparel, for them to learn um, more about the industry and understand all the different facets that go into play because while design is super important, like you wouldn't have any products without design, and, you know, so they hold a special place in my heart. But there's marketing, right? There's sales, there's product development, there's engineering when, as it relates to footwear. There's merchandising, which I've spent a lot of my career in. So there's all these different functions. Um, and I actually didn't know about any of that until I started actually in the, in the apparel industry. So I think a combination, I think social media has um, opened up the ability to learn these things. There's so much information out there. Um, but just having more of these conversations and you do such a great job of connecting dots for people based on your, what you're interested in. So I think just tuning into that and having more of these conversations, you know, having more of these type of discussions with other professionals in the industry and having them talk about their journey. Cause what you'll see really quickly is no one has had the same path. No one has very few people have had a linear path in the industry, yeah. meaning I started here and then I went up one role and then I went up to the next one. Um, and we can talk about sort of career pathing maybe later if you if you want. But um, and so there's many different ways to come in to the space. Uh, so that's what I would say. Yeah, that's a great point too because the I you know was kind of raised in the sense that I need to you know pick my career path and and just stick to it and move my way up, right? Yeah. And yes. I am a hundred percent to the core, not that. Like I, I'm mm -hmm. the furthest thing from that. I'm, I'm a million ideas and scatterbrained at all times. But like when I get excited about <laughs> something, I run at a thousand miles an mm -hmm. hour until I'm completely over it. And one mm -hmm. of the things I've had conversations with, with guests in the past is like, you know, we like going after those things and, and checking them out because we, we have such an, you know, a, the internet has given us so much ability to understand things so much more than like when you took your job at Nike or Jordan brand, you, you know, you really probably had no idea really, you know, you, you know, the basics of what needs to be done and you know how to do the work, but like the nuances that exist within all of these things, like people just don't know when they take a job most of the time. And now we have people talking about this, you know, in so many different spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think back to like college campus, when you said that about the, 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 you know, the recruiters at campus, I just remember thinking like everyone that was at one of those little you know, pop-up tents was a marketing person that like made it sound like, yes. Hey, everything is fun and games. Just come work here for every company, yeah. not Nike or, or Adidas or anybody, mm -hmm. but like literally every company. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I do think that's really fascinating to, to think about how people can 
you know, jump around to, to move places, right? Because ultimately you can experience so many different things. And I think like that's, you know, uh, kind of what you're saying about coming into it from apparel and, and tying in the footwear stuff. There's, you know, like there's so much more than just one element to all of these companies and brands now, right? So like you can really, you can really become an expert for the company in, in, in a lot of different ways than just getting on the, the, the ladder and trying to work your way up, it seems. So, yeah, I, you know, the thing I, the analogy I sort of came upon over the years was the best careers and the most fun experiences, when you look back at them, your the journey looks like a jungle gym more than it does a ladder. You know, yeah. you bop around, you may take a left turn, you'll go up, sometimes you go back, but then you, you zoom off to the right, you know. Um, and I would say that that's really what has contributed to whatever success you might say I've had is my level of curiosity. Like I'm a lifelong learner. You know, the, the best thing I, my most fun um, career experiences have been when people have said, it's a new job. We know it's, we know the work needs to get done, but we don't really know what it is. So, and then I've just been given the opportunity to figure out that's been awesome. I would also say that I have had, um, uh, the capacity to say yes to opportunities as they've come to me. So I think keeping an open mind is really important. You know, you may take a job that you're kind of iffy about, or you are maybe even scared to take because you don't, you're not the expert, you don't know. But saying yes to things, you'll be amazed at where you end up. You, where you end up. You know, if someone had said to me, "You're going to live almost four years of your life in China one day," there's there's no way I, w- I could have predicted that, and I would have just said, "No way, you're crazy." Like, but I did. <laughs> Yeah, And that experience so far has been my favorite job I've ever had, you know, when I was the GM for Jordan in China. Um, so I think the, and then of course the third one is just putting your head down and doing the work. I can't yeah. stress that enough and being less concerned about the promotion. I mean, that's important for acknowledgement. And of course you want to build, um, you know, compensation and all that's important, but doing the work and doing it at the best level you can. So that pursuit of excellence, which again is why Michael Jordan is probably, he has stuck with me through the years is that pursuit of excellence is, um, you know, he showed me what's possible when you commit and you work hard and you work harder than anyone else, all that good stuff. Um, and I won't go into platitudes around that idea, but just, I, that's what I would offer people to think about is what are you curious about? Follow that direction. Say yes to opportunities as they come to you, as long as they serve you. And then the third one is put your head down and do the work. <laughs> you gotta, I know people have said that and I don't want to sound like an old person saying you have to pay your dues, but you do, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, it's so true though. I, I you know, I, I've, I've been, you know, kind of going back to like what you said about internships, right? Like I was never in a position where I could have yeah. done that. Right. It was always like two or three jobs when I was in school, I was literally working like, you know, 60 hours a week and, and school on top of that. And, Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's interesting because there's a lot of, there's a lot of situations in, in my kind of career path where people have, you know, where we've, we've had interns that, you know, like at complex, for instance, there was a lot of unpaid interns, right? You go there because Mm -hmm. you're going to make a name for yourself. But like the people, there's plenty of people that, you know, sign up for it. Hey, I want to be an intern. I want to learn this stuff. But the people that took on the work and did the work, whether they were being paid for it or not, are the ones that really succeeded in all of that and moved up and onwards to different places. And, and I think that, you know, like there's, there's just something really interesting about the, the nature of, of work in the United States where, you know, free work is like a normal thing and it it doesn't feel right to me. And I'd love for that to be something that changes. Mm -hmm. But I also, to your point, really do agree that like, you know, once you realize that you can outwork everyone else in the room, it doesn't matter. It, you know, the other things that we think are important don't matter. And that just becomes like your drive and Mm -hmm. everything else falls in place after you figure that out. Right. Like you just continue to move forward with things. And, Mm -hmm. um, so I guess like on the note of things that I would love to see corporate America change, um, mm-hmm. we have a lot of these conversations in footwear and, in you know, sport and streetwear and all this stuff about like how to 
you know, like the brands will come out and say, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to put money towards this initiative. We're going to support the Black Lives Matter movement this last year. Right. Yep. But like. Yeah. As as someone who is not working for a brand and kind of ebbs and flows in and out of those relationships as a you know consultant or whatever, I never know if a company is actually sticking to their word. And that's something that's always bothered me. Mm -hmm. And I know that, uh, you know, it's really difficult because on the internet, if you say you're doing something, people harass you because you don't need to be talking so much about the things you're doing. And on the other yeah. side, they're like mad because you didn't say what you're doing. So I just would right. love to know your thoughts, you know, with so much experience in this industry, how do we, as consumers, as, as fans of these brands, you know, footwear being a really unique space because it's truly is like fans. It's not just a consumer. Mm -hmm. It's not just someone who, you know, walks into a store, grabs the milk and, and goes home. It's like people are yeah. absolutely dedicated to this stuff. But I'd yeah. love for the, there to be opportunity for, for, the, for the fans to, to kind of be looped in on those things or, you know, hold the brands accountable for the commitments that they make. And I, and I don't think that there's I don't think that anybody is intentionally like saying one thing and running with it. I think that's one thing that I do appreciate about footwear is the intention of the brands mm -hmm. primarily is, is good. Um, mm -hmm. But do you have any thoughts on how we could potentially make that whole situation better? Ooh, as fans. I mean, I, I guess I would like anything in this space. Um, I would say there's probably two things. One, your dollars matter. So where you spend your money, what you spend it on, speaks volume. You know, if people stop buying products from a certain, whether it's store or brand or fill in the blank, that doesn't align with what they believe in, or if they feel like to your, you know, to what you're asking about if they're not following up on those promises, that then people, you know, sit back and they pay, they pay attention to that. And in this era of social media that we're in, um, social sentiment carries a lot of weight too. So making your voice heard is a big one. Um, and I think recently, you know, there, there have been a lot of things in the news over the past year or so that where brands have been paying attention and you've seen where maybe a lack of um, being on the right side of history has hurt some brands, right? So uh -huh. I, would, I would always keep that in mind. You know, are you spending your money with places where, um, where you feel good about that? And if not, then that's a way to make pay attention. I mean, dollars matter at the end of the day and so does, um, social sentiment. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, as you know, you're probably in the same boat as me on this, but like, there's times where I just see things that brands do and just think, how did this yeah. get, oh, like, so many things have to go through so many layers of approval and conversations had to be had. Mm -hmm. And how do people not just stop things, you know, from, from, you know, um, but I think that, well, to that, I, I will answer that and say, in my perspective, the reason things like that get through is because of a lack of diversity. And, you know, I yeah. am super passionate about DEI and I work and the impact that can have both on business, but more importantly, people and communities. Um, but that's why diversity is important is because, uh, whether that is, gender diversity, race diversity, national origin, um, ability diversity, all of that helps you ensure that you're looking at things holistically. And when you and when things are only one sided or look through one lens, you could miss the bigger picture because you simply don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, like if somebody wanted me to review something on Northern European culture, I, I would have no idea, right? Like if something yeah. is appropriate or not, but because of my network, I know several people that I can call and say, hey, this feels funny to me, but can you put your eyes on it, right? And diversity brings that. Diversity also brings the, um, the ability to see opportunity and build out new revenue streams and bigger business opportunities where if you're not in tune with the culture or maybe with the sector of a consumer, you wouldn't understand that opportunity, right? Yep. Um, so I think diversity helps solve a lot of that. And when you see those things happen is because they didn't have people in those conversations that would have known and could have advised, or if you did, then they weren't senior enough to make the decision. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, right. so that leads me into the, the, the next question, right? Like, how do we oh. get, you know, how do we get more diversity? How do we get, you know, not to pick on myself, but less people that look like me in higher up positions within these brands, because, you know, like we, we know where all of this energy comes from, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I guess like, I wouldn't say all of it, but like a huge percentage of the energy yeah. comes from very specific backgrounds and places and people. And like, we still don't have that representation within the companies that we all buy product from and, and support and get excited about. And like, you know, I, I just think this is something that, you know, I mean, part of this is why I started this podcast because, Hey, these are conversations that can't just die when the, the, the news turns off and stops talking about the issues, right? This happens, mm -hmm. you know, once you get to a certain age, I think you realize like, Hey, this is going to happen every three to four years and people will talk about it. It'll be a big buzzword. People will yeah. use it to market their stuff. And then like you stop talking about it, but like, I just want to continue this conversation all the time and always be a place mm -hmm. where people can, you know, come in and learn about people that they don't know about that, at, that mm -hmm. have experiences that they don't know about. But I'm also, you know, very small in the big picture of how we could make a difference within some of these big businesses. And, you know, I don't know what, what like, how do we make it better? I guess. Um, it's a complex thing, but my answer is going to be really simple. And I, it could be the unpopular opinion, but I believe change starts at the top. And I don't think that any long-term sustainable change comes without there being a commitment from the CEO to that C-suite. And if it's not there, you can put anything again on a slide that you want, you know, and put some pretty words in a PR release. Um, and there may be a blip of change, but it's not, it doesn't become genuine and authentic and consistent without that commitment from the top. And what it also requires when you're talking about big companies is for them to think through their ecosystem of how they do the, whatever work they're in, you know? So it's not only about representation and um, design, you know, it's everything through the value chain. Do they have a commitment to bringing in diverse uh, perspectives and inclusive nature? Because not only do you, have, do you need to bring them in, but you need to have an environment that allows those people to thrive. So that's why my simple, my answer tends to be simple is if you don't have the CEO or the president or however your company is run, whoever's at the top, making it a business priority and then holding their direct reports accountable for delivering on whatever goals they set, it, the change doesn't happen, right? Um, and it's always better when change happens um, or when diversity is treated as a business priority like you would with anything else, you know, that you have goals in place, you're measuring against those goals, and then you've got a, an action plan against it if you're not hitting the goals, like what are you gonna do? And then you're repeating that throughout your process and you're making it part of your process versus it being a thing that the diversity team has to worry about. You know, it needs to be embedded in, um, in how you do business every day and through all your normal sort of business processes. Yeah, that that definitely makes sense. And I, and I think the other kind of part of that that's really i guess just in my experience i wonder this is like my debbie downer moment of of the conversation but like my experience don't you worry is... i'll bring you back up. <laughs> all right my experience is with most big companies and you know the leadership where an initiative gets put on their plate that says this is important whether that's tied to compensation or whatever it is, right? Like there's many ways that we can force mm -hmm. people to pay attention more, right? But mm -hmm. what, I've, what I've experienced is that most of the people in those situations don't have like the personal communication skills to realize that like <laughs> there's a difference between like being proactive in something versus just checking a box. And yeah. how do we, you know, how, how do we, how do we change that specific, you know, that's like the, the, the biggest wall I've seen co consistently throughout, you know, the 15 plus years that I've worked in footwear, right? Like it is absolutely yeah. like the people that, that say this is done because I, 
you know, marked it off on the spreadsheet versus the people that realize that nothing is actually done. And I would argue that this applies to everything that you do in life, right? Like if you're an active learner and you are passionate about bettering yourself, nothing is ever finished. Even your own self is never finished. So how do we get the people that think that it's just about filling in the spreadsheet and checking it off and reporting it on a call to understand that this is an ongoing conversation that we need to have all the time? It's a great question. I mean, again, I think it comes down to that commitment and then the accountability, right? So who's holding those leaders accountable? And if there's no accountability, to your point, it becomes a check the box exercise. And coupled with that, I should have made mention of this. I think representation is really important. If you have a company that doesn't have any diversity within its senior ranks, it's really hard to make that change. Um, Because there isn't someone that they can talk to about, about it with. So, and I also think when you have a more representative um, group of leaders, they're also doing the work of, at least I hope they are, of reaching back and creating opportunities for those that are going to follow them. And that becomes, um, you know, that's how you get the multiplier. Um, So if, you know, there are places where you're not seeing that change, it's about the accountability and thinking through, okay, well, how can we hold these people accountable, you know, for doing the things that they said? And I think the media has um, can play a large role. Like I think about all the sneaker blogs and the writers, you know, that are that have relationships with these brands. Like, why are they not asking about it? I mean, if there was a press release six months ago about, hey, Black Lives Matter, I haven't seen anyone ask, what progress have you made besides making a donation, which is, I mean, great. And I'm I'm so glad that companies are stepping up to support communities, but what are you doing internally? What is, what's different for your employees now than it was a year ago? Like, I think just like um, whatever you think of mainstream media or, you know, the big networks, I'll say, they ask the tough questions of politicians, whether or not they answer is a whole nother thing, but the questions yeah. are, the right questions are being asked. And I would say in our community, the same thing could happen. You know, um, a lot of, a lot of blogs hold a lot of weight and they can sway public opinion again, which is really a, an important thing. So I think asking those questions is, is, um, you know, important. I could not agree more. And, and I've been, you know, I've, I've been working on a million different things, but that's been something that's been weighing on me pretty heavily because I've been on, mm-hmm. I've been on basically all sides of this business at some point or another. And I, yeah, I, you know, unfortunately, like with, with sneakers, there's this, there's this perception that if you are, truthful and honest in your, you know, writing and reporting or however you want to, you know, go about sharing yeah. these stories that people are reading that you're not going to get sent shoes or you're not going to get advertising dollars. And I totally do think that that is a legitimate concern for mm-hmm. some people. I, but would, at the, I would probably agree. <laughs> yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, I think good people and, and good intentions, you're going to make a difference if you're just following your intuition, right? Like Mm -hmm. when, when we sit here and, and get into this, um, you know, we're we're in this like really interesting space where there's not a lot of talk about important things within the sneaker blogs. And I, I hope that, you know, many of my colleagues and friends throughout the years realize there's a huge opportunity to have more important things. And it's not always about the page views or the clicks or whatever that is, because we really do have this, like, we've, we've gone from, you know, you know, I, I would say very well-respected and, and very large publications online doing a lot of what traditional journalism, even having people that went to school for mm-hmm. journalism as a part of what's going mm-hmm. on to, yeah. you know, so many of these places have, have kind of been pushed into, pushed into and jumped into at the same time, right? Like, the the meme culture the the quick bits of like this is going to get a laugh and and i appreciate that stuff too but i also think that like once you get to a certain point you actually have the power to say something important to 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 have important conversations and you know it's i i just i've probably done this before but i always relate it back to like tupac and listening to tupac as a kid right like Mm you you can't Mm -hmm. you wouldn't have got me to listen to tupac with with just the Brenda's got a baby or dear mama or the songs that I really right. love because I was a kid and yeah. I wanted to fight and I wanted to party and I wanted to do all those yeah. things. So those songs draw you in 
And then you hear the message mm -hmm. that's behind it and not to mention the poetry and all that stuff, but like, you know, I'm like yeah. super fan. So I, I could go down that path too far, but I think that we're in a really interesting place with all of the media that could be, that we could flip it. You know, we could really see like, Hey, this isn't about like me trying to roll people under the bus because something went wrong. It's like, no, this is, this is something that we all collectively should deal with because it's going to be better for not only us in a few years, but the next generation and the, you know, our kids' mm -hmm. kids and all of the people that want to follow down this kind of industry and get excited about sports and sneakers and all the things. So, um, yeah. And I think there's also like, remember like these things, you know, asking a question and you know, so, you know, what you do is it's all about tone and how you handle it. Like if you approach it as I'm going to like, this is going to be a buzz creating piece. I'm going to get the scoop and I'm going to, you know, then that's not going to accomplish anything. You're going to get hurt in the process. Like you said, there's ramifications, but I think having a healthy dose of respect, but also asking the tough questions, um, you know, like look at Barbara Walters or, you know, yeah. um, you know, these Oprah Winfrey, like these epic journalists, they know how to ask the right questions in a respectful manner that just, you know, that, that requires an honest um, response back. And so I think, and at the same time, you know, I think you can have your fun and you can um, you can kind of fulfill your journalistic responsibility at the same time. I don't think it has to be an either or. Um, and I would also say like for all the creators out there and for the people who are le have leadership positions and agencies and all of the ancillary um, industries around sneakers, they can create a lot of change too. You know, if they're, if they got booked to do a project with the brand, are they looking around the room saying, Hey, we would actually like to have, you know, could we get a more diverse team working on this, for example, yeah. or, you know, like, and, and, and requiring that as part of, um, part of the contract. Um, or if, you know, you, you are running an agency yourself and you're running, you're, you're creating a commercial for someone or an ad um, or a media spot, you know, are you requiring that the talent is diverse, that the people behind the camera and behind the scenes, that there's a diverse team? So I would, I would ask people to think about all those different intersection points. It's not just about, um, again, the people designing the shoe or the people marketing the shoe. Uh, there's so many different ways that we can impact diversity if we just ask the question. A hundred percent agree. It's, it's interesting too. Like I, you mentioned, a few minutes back, um, sustainability in a different sense than what people think about sustainability. But I also think that like diversity is sustainability for businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you want your business to succeed and have long-term success, it's just like you would approach life, right? Like you can't, you can't isolate yourself with, you know, just the people that you're comfortable with or just the people that look like you or just the people that believe what you do. Cause we end up mm -hmm. in these crazy situations where like, you know, I don't want to get into that stuff, but like we could do that as a business and it, and, or as businesses, and we can really change that whole thought process, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah, absolutely. And I think like, that's another thing, I guess, like just, you know, the, the, the word sustainability is really interesting right now because I feel like it's become a, a buzzword for, for most companies, right? It's like, we're, we're doing, we're, we're trying to do this or we're doing that and we're, you know, green this, green that. And like, there's so many things that like, I don't think we can fix everything all at once. All of these things are long-term yeah. things that just have to become normal choices for everyday living for people. But do you, in your experience with like, you know, living overseas, do you like think about that stuff, at, you know, on a regular basis for what you do and, and how throughout your career has that changed? Cause obviously, you know, myself too, like I had a really interesting experience when the first vegan press release came 15 years ago. And I was like, this is just like all plastic man-made mm -hmm. stuff, right? Like we've thankfully shifted away from that. But ha what is your yeah. experience with that whole kind of world, Ben? Yeah, I think um, what I would say is I think the company, I would say it's more than a buzzword. I think most places now recognize the severity of the direction that we're headed in. And if we, as an industry, don't take responsibility for what we're contributing and addressing that, like, we're not going to have a place to sell products. We're not going to have consumers, maybe yeah. not in our lifetime, but a couple of generations. So I do think that people recognize, like, the, the threat is real and that within 
sneakers, but more, I guess, apparel, you know, the impact on the environment is um, astounding, you know, whether it's to make a pair of jeans or to make a t-shirt, um, you know, the water used, the dye is used, what gets released in the air. And so I think companies really are trying to figure it out, at least in my experience. Yeah. Um, and it could be in different ways, you know, like how are they packaging product? Can they rethink that? So I think what you're seeing is a lot of trial and error and a lot of failing forward fast, you know, trying things doesn't have an impact. No, but what did we learn? Apply it, download that rinse and repeat. So I actually take it as I think the intent is really good and comes from a good place. And yeah, I think that the more, you know, um, the younger generations care more than older generations did because it's impacting them more. Right. And they believe in that impact or that potential impact. Um, and they're aligning their shopping habits and the brands that they support with um, what they believe in, you know? So if a brand wants to capture that younger consumer, it's even more imperative that they start doing the right thing in a more overt way um, as more and more, you know, kids are shopping their values and that's around the world. So I would say, and if I look at my career, I would say the last 10 years is where sustainability has really become, you know, part of our normalized business conversation, you know, whether that is, like I said, looking at packaging, looking at are there better ways that we can transport product? I think when you look at retailers who are rethinking the old, like you have one or two distribution centers and it serves the entire country, there's other ways to do that, that bring down your carbon footprint, all of that. So I would, I look at it as sort of, um, you know, the design thinking approach that that's used a lot in technology where you're ba you're, you're doing a lot of beta work uh, mm -hmm. that leads you toward an answer. And there's so much unknown and there has to, you know, there's a lot of innovation that's needed in this space, especially for the apparel and footwear industry to make an impact. Um, so that's the way I look at it is people are just trying whatever they can. And, I think more than ever, progress means more than perfection. That's it's good to hear your optimism on that because I think that's something that it's so easy to 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 go down the wrong path with that, right? Like there's just yeah, it's, I think it's a it's a an obvious challenge right in front of all of us, and I hope that you know the same the same as we were talking about about diversity within these companies at higher levels. Like I hope that mm -hmm. all of that continues to be at the highest levels of conversation because. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a huge, like, you know, not only for our own good as a society, but I also like a hundred percent agree with the, the youth, you know, like I have a younger cousin who is very much about this, you know, and mm -hmm. like life's work and purpose type, you know, belief with it. And I think that is so powerful to, to see. And I hope that, you know, we have more of those young generations getting to talk to those mm -hmm. old generations that haven't had to like face this, you know, head on and, you know, kind of see yeah. some, some impact from that. But, and, um, and what I will mention too, is there's a lot of the behind the scenes work where you're seeing brands and companies now partner on initiatives. So, um, you know, for things to change at scale, one, one brand and one company is not going to be able to solve it, but when they pull their resources together, um, they can, you know, they can put um, focus on an issue to solve it. So a lot of that is happening within the apparel space and footwear space, like on the sourcing and manufacturing side, working back with factories on more sustainable ways of make. Um, so I'm really optimistic in that space. And it, to me, it feels really good to see more companies taking it seriously. That's a great point. Do you think, you know, I, the, the one that comes to mind is like Adidas and Parley and like that partnership, mm -hmm. how they've just continued to push that message. Yep. Do you think that that, I, I mean, I, I guess from my perspective, you know, I've always just looked at like anything anybody does to raise awareness is great. But like, do you think that there's opportunities still for brands to, to seek out these kind of innovative, you know, whether they're you know, Parley and, and recycling the plastic out of the rivers and, and ocean. But like, is that something that can, can shift like that experience from a business, from a, you know, like a big business side, working with a smaller company that's doing something innovative like that. Do you think that that's powerful enough to shift the thought process of the people on the business side, you know, going forward? Yes. And I would say, Perhaps more importantly, it 
that learning and those partnerships contribute to better capabilities in the future, you know? So you use that example with Adidas. They couldn't have done that on their own today because they don't have the internal know-how, right? So that partnership is critical because think about that transfer of knowledge, you know, going into Adidas now and even into their manufacturing base. You know, none of these brands, well, very few of them own their own factories. So the factories that, um, and the brands are reliant on a lot of these factories to develop more of these technologies. So think about that knowledge transfer now to Adidas, to their manufacturing base. That manufacturing base is also making sneakers for other brands. So eventually you might see the ability to produce more product in that way, you know, um, in a couple of years, we don't know, or it may lead to an even better uh, material source. The other thing I think is, you know, just the ingenuity and the innovation that brands are putting forth and how to rethink, um, because it's not always about like finding some other, uh, I'd say recycle, uh, recycled uh, product. If you think about Nike's Move to Zero product, I love that collection, right? Mm-hmm. Um, of upcycling. So just taking straps from throughout their own process and figuring out ways to remake that into a product that looks great. I mean, I think that at the end of it all, like I think part of the challenge has been how do you use those materials to create a product that people still want? Because ultimately if the consumer doesn't want it, it doesn't matter if it's recycled or not, right? And it doesn't matter about its carbon footprint if it's just sitting on a shelf that then has to get salvaged at some point, you know? Yeah, um, most definitely. So I love that uh, that footwork collection that came out. I thought it was well done. Um, such an interesting concept about taking scraps and upcycling them into new products. So, um, but yeah, I think that these smaller companies that are focusing on figuring out how to do those things and then partnering with the big brands is how it can, how sustainability can get to scale faster than the big brands trying to figure it out on their own. So I'd love to see more of those type of partnerships happen. Yeah, me too. And and it's really interesting too, because like one of the things that the upcycling conversation is something I'm really fascinated about because mm-hmm. like, I mean, I guess as a kid, like I, my mom was always like putting things together and like making things work and like literally like sewing, like I, I remember just like the most, what now I look at it and think like, God, my mom was a genius, but like then it was I like, know, I don't right? want to like wear the this, right? Were like the next one's in shorts, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I'm really excited about, though, is like this, this like kind of just massive trend of, you know, the do-it-yourself design type stuff, right? Mm-hmm. It's very like just mm-hmm. using what's out there and making things happen. And, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's not just in footwear either, right? Obviously, you know, I think in the, you know, the, the highest of like, light is like a Tom Sachs type, but like you also see it with the YouTube creators like the Casey Neistats mm-hmm. and those that yeah. have taken taken the polished finish off of, of what they do and like that's okay, right? And that's such an interesting thing yeah. because we're all we're all like taught it's it's almost like I'm having guests, I gotta go clean the house, right? Like everyone yeah. does that, right? But it doesn't matter, you know, like, I mean, granted, if you're really, really messy, yes, don't, you know, have people over. But like, at the end of the day, the people that you're having to your house, you know, pre pandemic or whatever, uh, care about you, right? They don't, they don't care that, you know, maybe the dog's toy is on the floor or whatever it is, right? And I think that's the beautiful thing that's that's happening. And I hope that that continues because those creators could potentially even be more accessible to those smaller brands that are doing the innovative things in terms of like the, the materials and that, mm-hmm. that could then be a conduit to get into the bigger company like a Nike or Adidas too. So that stuff is yeah, super exciting awesome. to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah. So I, I guess like I want to shift into some more personal questions because, you okay. know, I can't, I can't remember when I started following you, we started following each other, but one of the things that, I have always enjoyed about following you is how much you travel and how like I just imagine that you have like this big pin board of a globe and you've been like, you know, checking off all these places for the last 10 to 15 years. But I think like too, like you're very transparent, at least if people follow you, you're very transparent about how important that is to you Mm -hmm. and the rest of what you do. So could you talk about that and then maybe how you keep that balance going when you're not able to 
get out and travel and have those, you know, moments of Zen to kind of get you back into focus. Yeah, well, that's definitely been put to the test in this past year, right, for me and probably for everyone else. So it's funny you asked. So I wore this T-shirt today that says I visited countries you've never even heard of. And my friend, uh, a dear friend of mine, gave it to me last summer as a birthday gift, along with my very first, believe it or not, map. I've always been on one of those pin-up maps where I could pin, like, uh, where I've been. But she gave me off one that, like, you scratch off. So my niece and nephew were, they loved being able, every time I came back from somewhere, I let them do it. Um and I guess what I would say is, it also, so because I'm from Egypt, uh, I went back for the first time when I was 16. And I remember having this sort of out-of-body experience when I saw the pyramids for the first time. Um, and that kind of feeling of seeing, of wonder, and standing in front of something and all has always um, stuck with me. And that I, I, I guess I keep chasing that feeling over and over again as I explore new places and countries. But what I found was I, again, that element of curiosity, I love learning about other cultures. I love, I'm a bit of a foodie, so I love trying different foods. Um, and as long as it's not insect related, I'll pretty much try <laughs> almost every, anything. Um, so that, um, you know, and I love to learn. So when I'm in a place like, yeah, I like to have fun and relax and whatever, but also I'm always like looking about like, what am I learning while I'm here? Um, and when I was 30, I uh, went to Jamaica for my 30th birthday with a friend. And as I sort of promised to myself, I said, I'm going to visit a new country every year. Well, I mean, I've since blown past that where I go like several times now. But that commitment like forced me to say, you know what, I'm going to take my time, take my PTO. And instead of like, I would never do a staycation. I'm just not built that way. Like I'm not sitting at home if I have time off. And I would use it as an opportunity to get away. And then for what I do for a living, it also became really important as I started to lead global businesses because through my personal travel, I started generating a really good sense of consumer differences in places. You know, I could understand why some footwear worked in, let's say, France, but we couldn't give it away in, in the UK or things work in America that would never sell overseas, you know, and I started to understand why. Um, so, I, you know, with anything, I think um, with more exposure comes more uh, education and learning. So, and I just have fun. Like it's my, you know, it gets me out of my, um, my, my comfort zone and out of routine. So. Well, so, so I guess speaking about like the learning aspect of that, how, or could you give an example of a situation where, you know, maybe you at the time were like kind of didn't quite understand what was going on, or maybe you just like one of those frustrating moments and you're just like, okay, well, I'm going to let this go and move forward. And then you came back around and learned from it. One of the things that I love talking to people about is like how we all kind of roll with the punches in, in a different way. Right. So like I'm asking that in that sense, I guess. Oh, God, I've had so many of those. Like, I think because I am, um, I am not like, I'm not shy about saying I don't know something. So I ask a lot of questions, I think, first and foremost. Um, but I'll give you an example. Like, when I first moved to China, there were a couple of things. Um, one, you know, we could never understand because before that, I was running the apparel business within Jordan. And then when I moved to China as the GM, um, I could never understand why we couldn't sell basketball shorts, you know, uh, like they like we did in the U.S. And then when I went there, I realized that there were several elements at play. Um, one being, and you know, like of course the China team was uh, always saying that, like they were kind of being a broken record about, like, no, we can't sell these year round. We did a blah, and but I guess what we were missing was the like the deep why behind that. So being in China like helped me see the consumer insight and not to say that I had to experience it personally, but because we weren't getting that deep why that really got at the, the crux of the situation. So that was a big, that was a big aha, you know, and it came down to two factors. One is, you know, when kids go out in China, they are dressed in lifestyle products. It's not like here in the days of the mall where you'd go and there'd be a band of teenagers and everybody's wearing a hoodie and a pair of basketball shorts. In China, if you're wearing a basketball shirt, you are either on a court, going to a court, or leaving a court. <laughs> That's it. So that was kind of number one. 
And then number two is, you know, they play basketball outside year round. So in the winter in China, it gets really cold, especially in the north. I mean, it's minus zero and people are still outside. So they're not going to be wearing shorts to play in. So when you take away the lifestyle aspect, and this is a really specific example, so sorry. Um, but if you take away the lifestyle aspect, and then on top of that, you're taking away the end use aspect of it, of the funk, you know, like the what it's intended for, then all of a sudden your business is like really small, right? Um, so that's a kind of business. <laughs> yeah, th- that's business great though. I mean, I think that. that's, that's totally relatable to people that are listening. Cause I think they'll have, you know, an understanding of, of all of those examples you gave, right? Like it, it is kind of interesting cause you don't really think about that. Like, like using the mullet as, as an example, like, sh- you know, shorts and a hoodie is like normal in the United States almost year round in a lot of places, even when it's cold outside, like you could go to a mall and see, you know, that's kind of just the usual fit for people. So, um, so my next question is, um, what advice would you give the young women that are looking to follow in your footsteps? You know, you've been obviously an inspiration for me. And I know that there are plenty of people that will watch this, listen to this and have followed you for many years that have always looked up to you and and what you've done. So like, I'd love for you to share, you know, what that would be for them to, to take and, and, and move forward with listening to this conversation. Um, Well, I would tell them to not try to follow my footsteps. I would say blaze your own path, you know, take, figure out what you're good at, or at least what you're interested in and jump at the, look for those opportunities. Um, I would say stay curious. I would say go to places where you can bring your authentic self and you can bring your authentic self and to always remember, which is something that I didn't actually um, realize or pay attention to, but there's only one of you, you know, six, over 6 billion people in the world, but there's only one you. And so none of those other people can bring what you bring. So just keep that in mind as you are kind of forging your way through life and through your career. Um, And I would say, you know, stay open to the possibilities because that is really important. I think you can always have a plan, but if an opportunity comes your way that's unexpected, you know, think about what you can learn from it. Think about like what, what, what could that job lead to that you may not have considered before. Um, And then I would say just, you know, continue to bring your A game every day and do your best because, um, I would say 95% of the time, you know, hard work is rewarded. It may take longer, um, but the cream usually rises to the top. So that's what I would say. That's great. I 100% agree. Um, and I want to add this because I've been thinking, sorry, a, a lot no, of go ahead. recently is, um, you know, there are some really talented people in the world that have a specific talent. And I am most envious of people who seem to know what their calling is at a young age. I am not either one of those groups of people. <laughs> and people are like, well, what are you good at? I'm like, I actually don't know, you know? But what I have realized I'm good at is just this ability to, um, I'm a consumerist. I'm always curious about like what moves people, you know? So um, connecting consumer insights with product. I'm good at making product um, or helping teams make product and then storytelling around it. So like anything that intersects consumer product and culture, that's sort of my sweet, sweet spot. But I say that to say, don't get discouraged if you don't know what your calling is, or if you don't look at yourself and say, you know what, I am a really talented designer or marketer or artist or writer, because I, I don't know, I, I don't have those things. But what I do have is perseverance, grit, resiliency. I'm usually up for anything. Um, and if I yes say yes to something, I'm going to work the hardest I can at it. So I just say that because I know there's a lot of people that surf, that like don't know what their passion is in, is in life. So just, um, you know, pick something and, and try it. And if you don't like that, you can try the next thing. Um, so I wanted to add that because it's yeah. been on my mind a lot lately. That's great. That's so awesome. Um, so I, I, I guess my my last question is what is, what is like the, the dream opportunity for you at this point in your career? Or, you know, what, what are, what are you manifesting for the future? (laughs) You know, I was, uh, God, that's a great question. Um, 
You mean other than like winning the lottery and never having to, <laughs> you know, work again? No, so, honestly, like I think, you know, my um, dream would be, you know, I would love to run a brand someday as whether that's CEO, founder, president, whatever. Um, but the ability to create opportunities for other people, the opportunity to create some cool things with some cool people, um, the ability to make a mark on the world in a positive way. So that would be my dream state coupled with, you know, I'd work hard for three months and take a month off. <laughs> work three months, take a month off and go live on some island. That would be my dream state is a kind of three months on, one month off. You can see that all of my dreams circulate around being on an island, traveling. How can I get away? <laughs> But that's that's the beauty. That, I mean, it's so funny because we, you literally, like my my mission statement in in life, personally, is to create opportunities for others. So mm -hmm. you're literally saying exactly what I am like doing. All of these things that I do for, and I am also exactly in that same place where like I run a million miles an hour for like three to six months, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna. I gotta just put the phone down, walk away from like. Just give yeah. me a tent somewhere near the ocean and like a, a few few weeks of, you know, recuperating from all of that. Because I think, yeah. you know, in order to give that energy to people and provide that energy to people, you have to be able to, you know, find that en energy for yourself. So I think that makes total sense. Yeah. And honestly, if we can make that a corporate thing where we just work three months, one month off, I'm, I'm all for that too. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I wanted to ask you because I, I realized I didn't know this about you, but what's your favorite speaker? Uh, and, so, and is there a holy grail, personal holy grail that, you've, that you are wanting but haven't gotten your hands on yet? So it's really difficult for me to say what my favorite sneaker is because at the end of the day, most of the time, it's just a, a pair of Chuck Taylors. Um, I think that they are the most universal shoe. Like yeah. I can take an all black shoe and go to a death metal concert. I can take the traditional, you know, one and go talk to great grandparents that are like mm -hmm. back in my day. I can yeah. also, you know, you know, it's, it's a part of hip hop. It's a, it's a part of basketball. It's a part of motorcycles. It's part of like a lot of my friends that were into cars back in the day used to wear them. So, mm -hmm. so it's hard for me to say, anything but that because it's so it's such a powerful universally you know connected point between all of us as human beings um if if i had to say something other than that um it's probably it's probably true blue jordan threes uh mm, good one yeah i love those those were kind of the ones that when i was young you know, like I said, we lived with people from the church. So we lived in a nice neighborhood, like, but my family was in, you know, somebody else's house, but all the kids in that mm -hmm. neighborhood had all the bulls colored Jordans. And oh. I remember going to the mall and like, you know, back then the true blues and the military fours weren't like the, they weren't front and center, right? Nobody wanted mm -hmm. blue Jordans because Michael wore black and red. Um, right. Yeah. So I always just like gravitated towards those because it was like, I remember going to the mall and seeing the true blues and thinking like, what are these? Like, this mm -hmm. is like the craziest thing I've ever seen because, you know, I had known like the Carolina story and the shorts, you know, like I wore shorts under shorts back then because Michael did, right? Like everybody yeah. kind of did that stuff. But like, so I, I think it probably comes down to like the true blue three and maybe the, the military blue four. I, I've always loved those two just for that nostalgia. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And as far as a grail, uh, boy, you know, I, I, I've been really lucky to have shoes. Like um, I would love to be able to gift shoes. Like that would be my, mm -hmm. I would love to show up with a U-Haul full of sneakers and give them out to people anywhere I go. Like that's like my ultimate yeah. goal. Um, I really just am thankful that I've been able to like, you know, make a lot of things happen in this whole footwear industry. And it's kind of crazy because mm -hmm. like growing up, it was always, how do I attain more and more and more? And at some point you realize like, it's not really, you know, not to go against the marketing, but it isn't the shoes, right? It's the people. Like, <laughs> I just want to be able to connect with people and, yeah. and like, I'd love to be able to, you know, 
find grails and gift them to people, you know, like some program that just like gets people that don't get to t share their story. So it's hard for me to pick one. My, my, my kind of default favorite as of late, um, is probably shattered backboards being a giants fan. Mm. It's the, mm -hmm. just a great colorway for me. And yeah. the Jordan one's kind of classic in so many ways that it's, you know, especially being somebody who literally like skateboarded and rode a BMX and played basketball and played football and played baseball all in like one pair of shoes for so many years. Like yeah. the Jordan yeah. one kind of just is the only one that, that fit across everything to me. So. Yeah, um, those are beautiful. I think that that release um, was, way more successful than anyone internally could have imagined on, the, on that shattered backboard. I mean, it was really a cultural phenomenon, right? Yeah. Um, but the execution on it was beautiful. Yeah. How, how about you? What, what are, what's your grails? <sighs> um, well, I would say my, like my favorite sneakers hands down is the band AJ one, the white cement three and, um, and the Concord 11, those are my three. Like if I was, you know, the question of if you're on a desert island and you can only take three seekers, those would be my three. Um, but the, the, there's two that I've always wanted and can't seem to get my hands on. So one is the mythical Wu Dunk, just because I'm a, such a Wu fan. And then the other one is the original Safari Air Max one. That would be nice. Yeah, actually, now that you said that, I always wanted, because I'm from Sacramento originally, and mm -hmm. the Deftones were one of my favorite bands as a kid. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're still one of my favorite bands. Like, I'm still a kid. But, like, those dunks were always like, how in the world did this happen for some, you know, I mean, I realized that they're a massive band. But, like, even even when it when it started showing up on the, on the Nike Talk forums, it was like, how did this happen? Like, Deftones is in Sacramento. I don't understand. Like, it just didn't connect right. to me that, yeah. like, the guys I was looking up to in my neighborhood somehow partnered with Nike to have this, yeah. you know, <laughs> shoe, right? right? So th that's probably actually a grail for me. Like, I would love to have yeah. a pair of those because it just would, it'd be something that would just make me happy every time I look at yeah. it or hear their music. So, yeah. yeah. But, well, cool. um, it's been so awesome to talk to you. Thank you so much for spending the time with me. Um, I guess let everyone know how they can find you or follow you online. Yeah. Um, so my handle is just my first name, last name. So at Reham Habib on Twitter, Instagram. Um, and thank you for having me. This has been amazing. It's so good to finally meet you in person after so many years of being social media buddies. Uh, but keep doing what you're doing. You have such an important voice. And I love this format that you've um, started. Um, and you're doing a lot for, you know, the community, which is amazing. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, yeah. for tuning in, for watching. Thank and you. we'll catch you, you next time. Peace. Bye.